You know, today I just want to thank everyone for being here with me. And if this is your first time here, welcome. I'm Kit and today, Allie has the weirdest take on feminism I've ever heard. Before we get into it, I would like to note that I don't know Allie or Gabriel, and these are my thoughts and opinions on the content they put out for public consumption. That being said, thank you for clicking on this video, and I would like to give extra thanks to my patrons. Links to my socials and Patreon are below, along with sources and resources, and now, on to the reason we're all here. I don't know how I missed this. Back in May, conservative commentator Allie Beth Stuckey, host of the Relatable podcast, did an interview with Gabriel Finocchio, host of the Reactionary Christian podcast, and the interview was titled, Feminism is Gender Dysphoria. I just about fell off my chair when I saw that, and of course, I had some thoughts on it. Now, the interview is over an hour long, and most of it was about theology, so I'm just going to focus on the feminism section and see if they can explain what they mean by that title. But I do have a few clips I want to share first, and I do want to warn, I guess, that some of, most of, the clips in this video are going to be a bit long, but I wanted to make sure we get the gist of what they're saying, and my goodness, does he wander. To start, let's get to know some of Gabriel's beliefs. I would probably be to the right of my brother. Um, you know, I might even be to the right of, you know, people on the right. So yeah. <laughs> our civilization is in uh, decay. As Chesterton said, we're forgetting obvious things um, like the fact that men are men and women are women. Um, but there's there's ant th there's it's not just decaying like a cheese. Um, it is also being attacked. Um, by the orcs, if you, and and there's anti-Christianity uh, that is attacking our, Christ, our our Christian civilization, and so we can we have a decision to make. We can um, we can go back and forth um, about differences in our uh, respective Christian denominations, and 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 you know churches, uh, which is fine. I'm totally cool with having all those conversations, and um, maintaining those distinctions. But um, if we are not careful, uh, and if we do it in a disproportionate way, we're going to be doing it in a concentration camp eventually. I've called myself a conservative Christian nationalist in the past, and I start with conservatism simply because I do believe that there are certain uh, major things that must be conserved um, in order for life to exist. Uh, there, we, we, you know, we, we, there are. If you look around, like you know, there's the moral order that needs to be conserved, right? Um, there are chief uh, issues of human doom that that are in, weigh, being weighed in the balance in any civilization. Uh, so I, I suppose, you know, I, I'm, I'm wanting to conserve the main elements of our civilization. But when I look at the main elements of our civilization, uh, things to conserve, I look at it and I say, well, we have you know, the main element of our civilization has been Christianity. And so I want to, as a conservative, I want to conserve Christianity because I think Christianity is the most important element of our civilization um, because it's given birth to our civilization. And w without Christianity, we wouldn't have a civilization. Uh, we would be back in the uh, first century. Uh, we would be back in the catacombs. We would be back in pagan times, uh, genuine pagan times, where they worship Caesar, mm -hmm. um, and their and then all and all of their cultural customs. You know, they didn't celebrate Christmas Day, they didn't celebrate Easter, they didn't they, they didn't even celebrate Saint Valentine's Day. So, you know, again, our our customs, our conventions, our Christian conventions, and um, our even our psychology is Christian. You know, when we walk down the street and we see someone begging for money, we reach into our pockets. That's not a pagan custom. The pagans would have said, well, the gods have decided that he should be poor and I should be rich. But Christianity has changed all of that, even down to our psychology. And and that's for that goes for the atheists too. Their psychology is very Christian. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have we have Christian atheists is what we have. And I want to conserve. Uh, I think it's a good idea to conserve our nations. Mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I think it's a good idea for Americans to conserve America, uh, and for the French to conserve France, and for the English to conserve England. And so. Uh, I'm a nationalist um, because th I think that nationalism 
was the tradition of the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. I think I think if we don't have nationalism, what we will have is internationalism. And I, I look yeah. at internationalism as the, you know, we call it globalism, um, but it's internationalism. And it is the refusal to recognize nations as nations and as sovereign. And uh, I think America is being attacked by uh, globalist interests, uh, cosmopolitan interests, uh, people who are indifferent to uh, the, 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 the nation of America and and really all nations and they want to destroy the identities of these nations and the rich heritage and histories of these nations so uh the real danger is, uh that we would that that I'm trying to avoid is the danger of idolatry because you see if we don't worship god we will fall into idolatry yeah and uh i think pluralism is idolatry. I think pluralism, uh, the the allowance to to worship any god and every god that you know imaginable, um, to the refusal to define who God is, that is idolatry. Hmm. And uh, the 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 problem with idolatry um, on a practical level is that God punishes idolatry. Christian atheists that. The people who are trying to fundamentally change our country and who would like to forgo this idea of Christian morality entirety, they think that they will be able to conserve the Christian things they like in a godless nation. So they think exactly. that we can still have compassion. We can still have charity. We can still be against things like theft and murder if we no longer have the foundation that the Bible gives us for these things. They don't, of course, correlate uh, this right to property with God's commandment against theft and against covetousness. But of course, that's actually where it comes from. And the founders knew that too. And so they think that they can remove the foundation and that the edifice won't fall down, but it will. You're never going to be able to preserve the vestiges of Christianity that you like in a pagan nation. And progressives don't realize that. Atheists that I've had on this podcast, when I ask them, okay, you and I agree that murder is wrong, or sometimes we might agree that like Marxism is wrong or all of these things. And when I ask them why, but why, why do you believe that's wrong? Where are you getting that idea that that is wrong and that this is right? And even the most clever atheists that I've had, they can't really tell me that. And they actually think it's the more sophisticated position to be like, well, it just is. And I am the rube over here that has to have God to determine mm -hmm. my morality. When really it's the opposite. It is very absurd to say that something is wrong if no one has ultimately told you that it is. We use the word love all the time. Love is a Christian virtue. Yeah. It's a Christian virtue. Hope is a Christian virtue. And we love these words, hope. You know, I remember when Barack Obama was running, it was hope and change, right? But hope is a a Christian virtue. We're getting, we're using these words because we're Christians. And we're, you know, love, we're using that word. That's a Christian word. That's that's not a word um, that is... That, that you can find neutral. in the ancient world. Right. None of us have lived through paganism. You know, none of us have really seen that. We can see bits and pieces of it today with the gender madness and with abortion and all of that. All of those are just forms of child sacrifice that we saw in pre-Christian pa uh, paganism. We'll see it in post-Christian paganism too, but on a much larger scale once, if, if Christianity no longer tempers, I think, the evil that we see today. Yes, I, I totally agree. If man tells us, you know, to close the churches during COVID, sorry, we're not going to obey you. We're going to defy that order. Yeah. And thank God, thank God for the pastors who did. Um, and it's shame on the pastors who didn't. <laughs> we talk a lot about man, the rights of men. Uh, we, we, we talk very little about the rights of God hmm. and, uh, you know, God has a right to be recognized in the state, but he also has a right to be obeyed above the state. We have some repenting to do as Protestants, I would say, because you know, we've abandoned as Protestants the 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 you know Reformation teaching that birth control is immoral. And you know, I I, I don't think there was one Protestant theologian before the year 1900 
who would have believed that that birth control um, was moral. You know, I don't just want to pick on the gays. You know, I, I want to say, look, you know, we, we're acting just like them you know, because we're having sterile sex. This man also runs Theos U, which claims to teach people theology in bite-sized formats. And if you're wondering, Ali finds Gabriel and his brother to be among the most articulate and interesting people. Does Ali know what articulate means? And does Gabriel know who Ali is? The author of Toxic Empathy isn't giving homeless people anything. I do love how Ali thinks she ate, Finally, I understand that phrase by saying that you can't know something is wrong if someone ultimately doesn't tell you it is. And she has no idea how concerning that is to hear. Big brains over there. Anyway, on to the real reason I'm making this video, Gabriel's claim that feminism is gender dysphoria. I hope everyone is ready for this. I would just say that the fundamental issue with feminism is that it is gender dysphoria and it's rooted in uh, a misunderstanding of, of of what it means to be gendered. I've listened to this more times than I care to admit, but though I don't think he ever explains what it is to be gendered, he goes back to the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention and seems to think that the statements made there were saying that being a woman isn't good enough, women need to be men. And that's not what it was at all. I think all the problems that we're seeing with with gender currently are you know, the, the children of feminism, uh, because it, and, and this, I would say this goes all the way back to first wave feminism. Um, and now that's you know, a hot take and that's a take know, that most conservatives won't say. So yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> well, I fear the Lord rather than man. All right. Yeah. No. Uh, you know, I do, I, I fear the Lord rather than woman, um, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, I fear women more than men, but the point is simply that, um, that you know the issue with uh, first wave feminism is that if you read these these articles, you know I'm, I'm referencing the Seneca Falls Convention. Um, I think it was in 1848. Um, they listed a number of their goals, and it was essentially all uh, based around a, a desire to um, to basically be equal to men in in all things. Um, and and but also to to attack the 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 understanding of what it was to be a woman up until that point. If anyone wants to read the Declaration of Sentiments in full, I'll link it below. But it's not a list of things women must do. For that matter, feminism in general doesn't give a list of things women must do or must not do. Its focus is changing the law and attitudes toward women so that women's lives aren't constricted by the fact that they're women. That is not hard to understand. But that's actually Gabriel's problem with feminism because he believes God created women to be one way and since feminism doesn't funnel women into that way, well, that's a problem. Women can't have choices, but of course he can't say that and it is a bit fun to watch him do backflips trying to convince people that feminism is bad actually. He even brings Jane Austen and Queen Victoria into it. Well, it's an interesting thing uh, that the feminist movement rose in the age of Queen Victoria. Um, because we're talking about the Victorian era, you know, a, 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 an era of time that was based upon uh, a, a queen, you know, a, a woman. And that understanding of what it was to be a woman up until that point um, was a part of the basic, you know, order of society, Christian society. And, and uh, you know, even, you know, 50 years prior to that, you, you would have had Jane Austen writing these novels that we still read today and that we love. But Jane Austen wasn't a feminist, and she really understood uh, the female psyche as well as, you know, the male psychology and, and how men think. She actually writes very good, accurate descriptions of men. Um, but but Jane Austen wasn't a feminist. I referenced um, uh, Jane Austen before, but, you know, when you're reading Jane Austen novels, you're not reading the novels of a, of a woman, you're reading the novels of a highly intelligent woman um, who has no problem expressing herself, but she doesn't spend any time on the oppression of women. Uh, she, 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 and you know, she, she was unmarried. She never married. I think she had, you know, an opportunity, but it was later and, you know, she just bypassed it, but she was not a, she was not, you know, you know, uh, rallying the troops 
trying to, you know, start a movement saying, you know, these all all the all the female characters that I write uh, are oppressed. I mean, none of them were, and they were all, you know, she was just dealing with with women as women and men as men and society as it was, and and she, but yet in a highly intelligent way. Um, and it was just a, it was, it was, there was a peace, there was a calmness in her writing, um, as it pertained to the differences between the sexes. And it was, it was like, no, this is good. This is healthy. And this is why we still enjoy these, these stories. A woman being a queen doesn't mean women's oppression isn't real. And I find it strange that he's referencing first wave American feminism and talking about two British women. And I'm not sure what Jane Austen, a British woman who passed 30 years before the Seneca Falls Convention choosing to write fiction, has to do with anything. It is telling though that he doesn't see women having to marry lest they become homeless as oppression. Apparently, a woman must plainly state, this is oppressive, otherwise everything is fine. I also want to add that I do enjoy Jane Austen, but I wouldn't want to live in that period. Anyway, let's get into the meat of Gabriel's objections to feminism. You know, we're at a point where <laughs> You know, we're below the, you know, Elon Musk is saying, hey, if we don't start having children, we're going to, you know, die off like a like a like the dinosaurs. Um, we're below the, the, the birth rate is below the replacement rate. We're having less children. We're having less marriage. We're having so. But this and this I would say this is because feminism has told women what to do and said, no, you will you will act like men. Well, so now we just have a society of men now <laughs> and people that act like men. <laughs> you know, it's like we no wonder we're not having kids. You know, there's no complementarity. There's no the family isn't what it, it, it ought to be. It's an unnatural um, feminism is a, it's an it's it's foisting an unnatural expectation upon women and it's deleting femininity. You know, we, we talk about toxic masculinity, but really feminism is toxic femininity. And um, and I think it's an attack on women because pe some people will object and say, well, you, that sounds so misogynistic. It's like feminism is misogynistic. There's been a war on women. All right. But and the war, on, <laughs> the, the, the war on women, in my opinion, is feminism. Yes, it has really hurt women. And again, I, I'm, I'm speaking in the main. Uh, because because, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that every single woman. Uh, yeah. You know, I think I think women can handle things differently. Some women are, you know, one talent, three talent, five talent. There's there's a there's a degree of ability. Um, but I'm just saying that um, what we've done is we've we've essentially, you know, desexed women and yeah. said, no, just act like a dude and don't, you know, delay marriage, delay childbirth, you know, uh, do, do all these things that are against your instincts <laughs> and then you're going to be happy. Yeah. Well, I don't think, I think the studies even show that women are, are, are not as happy, um, as they, they ought to be. There's a lot of bribery that takes place. Like, you know, you're going to be financially independent. You're going to be, people are going to respect you. You're going to be an independent woman like Beyonce. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, you know, Beyonce is not even independent. She's married. So yeah, <laughs> with kids, as I said, from the beginning, I think feminism is rooted in gender dysphoria. And I think that, um, you know, it's, it's been a movement that has regressed, uh, uh, female development as it, per and, and, as it pertains to, you know, what women, how women view themselves in public life. I think there's a confusion about it. And it's resulted, as I said, the child of, of feminism is transgenderism, where, you know, if there's really no difference between men and women, then really what's the difference at all in gender? Why do we even need gender? Can't gender just be, isn't gender just a social construct, just a, uh, an idea of our minds? Isn't sex itself just an idea of our minds? Can't we, be, you know, kind of bend this and shape this? Um, that is, those are the logical conclusions um, from this premise that <clears throat> says that women uh, do not have a particular role to play, um, that the the female, that femininity does not have uh, definition to it. 
and that there there are not uh, particular things that uh, women should do, that they yeah. ought to do. Why does he think women ought to be happy? And again, does Allie know what articulate means? From what I can gather of his rambling, he thinks feminism is misogynistic because to be a woman is to be a wife and mother, and feminism says you don't have to be a wife and mother if you don't want to be, and if you do want to be a wife and mother, that doesn't have to be the single focus of your life. And that somehow gets turned into being against marriage and kids. It doesn't make sense, but it's enough for their audience. And I just want to say this man is so bad that he got Allie, of all people, playing devil's advocate and asking if, you know, Maybe things were so bad back then that women did need feminism. He had a really rambling answer that I won't subject you all to, but in brief, Christianity elevates women, not feminism, so we need Christians, not feminists. Allie does agree with that, so I th well, no. Both of them know that the Bible has been used to subjugate women. They're just choosing to ignore that for their own purposes. And now to have Allie jump in. I don't hear you saying that women have no talents or strengths outside of homemaking or child rearing or that they shouldn't ever be educated or that they shouldn't ever have a job, but that these things should not come at the expense of marriage and childbearing. And what I yes. think of when you say that, and I do, I agree, the more that you're talking, the more I'm thinking about how it really is kind of a form of gender dysphoria. I'm sorry. Is she trying to say that women delaying marriage and kids or choosing not to marry or have kids at all is gender dysphoria? That's not what gender dysphoria is. This is so bad faith, but we're not done. I promise we're almost finished, but first we have to talk about telos? Telos meaning purpose. Like there is a teleology to the world, including mm -hmm. the human body. And that is mm -hmm. kind of going back to what we were saying about how people won't order in everything except for in themselves. That is true now of gender. It's true now of our body. We see the purpose in a pillow. We see the purpose in a bird. We know that a bird can't be an elephant, but we do believe for some reason that we're so different that a man can be a woman and vice versa. And even if it is not in the form of actual transgenderism. It does come in the form of gender roles. The fact of the matter is, is that a woman's body has a womb for a reason. And our telos tells us something, not just about who we are, but what we are for. Now, we know that we live in a fallen world. There are women who want to be married, have done everything possible to try to be married, and they're mm -hmm. not. Who want to have right. children, they have tried everything possible to have children, they haven't been able to have children naturally. So we understand that. But that does not yeah. mean that in principle, like women should be avoiding having children and marriage just because it is possible for us to do other things. If it means that we are like bypassing marriage and children to pursue those other things. So there you have it, ladies. You might have talents, dreams, goals. You might not even want to have kids or get married, but if you have a womb, that is what you are for. And that is why they don't like feminism. It allows women personhood and they can't have that. It also allows women options, the ability to make her own decisions, and they also can't have that. Yes, I do believe, of course, that women are of equal worth. Women can be brilliant. They can be talented. They can be hardworking. They can do all of these things and we have equal dignity. Um, but I don't need feminism to tell me that. I just need Jesus because Jesus is who tells me that. And so the world needs more Christianity if we want to uplift women in the healthy biblical sense, not feminism, which, as you said, has actually hurt women in providing for us hormonal birth control and abortion and pushing us into the nine to five grind and telling us you can just freeze your eggs then go through IVF when you're 45 and then have 20 embryos on ice that you pay to have frozen every month. That's, as you said, that is not liberation. That is not what was promised to us by the first generation of feminists. And yet that is where we are. So if Jesus didn't tell Allie that women have worth, would Allie not think so? And feminism isn't about telling women they have worth. We already know we do. Feminism is about getting that worth recognized. Also, first generation feminists promised liberation in a nine to five and the ability to freeze our eggs. I had no idea they could see into the future. 
But yes, being able to control your fertility and being able to make your own money is liberating. If Allie doesn't like it, she's free to not use birth control and not engage in paid employment, though that would require agreement from her partner. And that's it. Feminism is gender dysphoria. Oh, I forgot. It's also misogynistic because it doesn't tell women they are their wombs and their wombs are their worth. And Allie doesn't know what either articulate or interesting means. And that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.